Join us as we celebrate black history and culture. Eyewitness News presents Honoring Black History. Hello, I'm Nick Toma. I'm Candace Kelly. Welcome to a special Eyewitness News presentation honoring Black History Month. A time set aside to mark the contributions, sacrifices, and the rich traditions of African Americans from the past, present, and future generations. Now in the next hour, we will mark milestones and celebrate Black History Month. We begin with history in the Electric City. Louise Tanner Brown certainly made her mark in the world in the 1920s. She was way ahead of her time in the business world as an African American and a woman. Eyewitness News reporter Mark Killer has her proud history. So this was a, a profile on Louise Brown. Um, there's a closer up photo of the, the trucking company. Louise Tanner Brown and Trucking Company are synonymous when it comes to business success stories from the 1900s in the city of Scranton. Photos and other resources from the Lackawanna Historical Society helped flush out her accomplishments. You have to go back to 1920, when at the age of 37, the trained hairdresser from Western Pennsylvania married George Brown, an African-American owner of a drayage business on Cliff Street in Scranton. The business hauled products like those from the old grocery store chain a &P, using mostly low, horse-drawn flatbed wagons. Historically, draying usually is an occupation that was managed and, and run by, by black people. But in three short years, Louise Brown would unexpectedly become sole owner of GW Brown. In a part of downtown Scranton, now best known for buses and trains, is where the drain business existed, which Louise Brown took over in 1923, following her husband's death. How she managed to build up that business as a 20th century black woman in this city is no small feat. At the time, it was unheard of for a woman to run such a significant business, let alone a black woman in a largely white community. With no prior personal experience of running the day-to-day -day business, she phased out the horse-drawn draying wagons in favor of trucks which she financed and oversaw a staff of both black and white employees. In 1923, the business was operating at about $35,000 a year. Um, by 1930, within six years, they had doubled their, their fleet of trucks and they were up to in this business in the, in the, in the $70,000 range. Brown lived as a widow along Prescott Avenue in Scranton's Hill section at a home that no longer exists. Her reach extended beyond business in the Electric City, according to Black Scranton Project, a nonprofit dedicated to archiving and celebrating African American heritage and culture of the Scranton area. Black Scranton Project founder and CEO Glennis Johns profiled Brown at a 2020 exhibit. Johns research revealed Brown was an active member at Bethel AME Church, a board member of the NAACP, and was chosen in 1940 as one of the 10 outstanding women of Scranton. Despite Brown's legacy, there is no lasting tangible reminder of her life in northeastern Pennsylvania, no historical marker, and no grave marker where she's buried in the Scranton area following her death in 1955. As we're, we're moving through and we're starting to talk more and more about women and about untold stories in history, um, Louise Tanner Brown comes up an awful lot. She's one of our favorites. Um, but we, we, we would like to have some, a bit more official recognition of, of what she accomplished and what her, her place in, in Scranton society was. In Scranton, Mark Hiller, Eyewitness News. The campus of Bucknell University, nestled in Lewisburg, Union County, prides itself on being a campus of diversity and inclusion. Edward McKnight Brawley, the first African-American student, graduated from Bucknell back in 1875. Eyewitness News reporter Sean Coffey tells us how his legacy lives on in 2021. Just six years after the end of the Civil War, a young man from South Carolina became the first African-American student to enter the halls of Bucknell University. But the legacy of Edward McKnight Brawley, according to Bucknell's Associate Provost for Equity and Inclusive Excellence, Nikki Young, extends beyond his role as a racial trailblazer. He represents the, uh, for me, the simultaneity of being the first and only for a time 
and what the only part means, what it means to be minoritized in a place where you're learning, where you're growing. Young says the burden of Brawley's experience as a pioneer on campus makes his accomplishments even more impressive and strikes a chord with Bucknell students of color 150 years later. That might really resonate with some of our students now, right? What it means to um, narrate stories that are unfamiliar to people, racialize stories and histories that are unfamiliar. And the labor of doing that while you're trying to get your own education is significant. Fast forward to the 21st century and Bucknell's Grio Institute encourages students to explore the intellectual currents and history of the black experience. Simone Forche is the head of the institute and says the foundation laid by the first African American students on campus can't be understated. They were the first and they were such a small cohort. Um, but they started to build a legacy for others to build upon in later decades and um, generations. Nor can Raleigh's concerted effort to return to those communities of color and pay that legacy forward. He returned to those spaces in order to sort of keep the cycle of possibility open and to do those in really safe uh, in community-based ways. It's a sacrifice cherished by the next generation of Bison students, students like Fatima So. It's nice to know that there um, are people that kind of paved the path for us and um, made sure that we were able to have access to a lot more things that they wouldn't. And a legacy that challenges students to live up to it and to never slow the fight for justice. We're still having the first black dot 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 for so many things nowadays is a little heartbreaking but still inspiring at the same time um, because that means that like our generation can influence that and make it even better. After graduation, Edward McKnight Brawley went on to establish churches throughout the South. He would become the president of Selma University and Moore College, which he also helped establish. Still ahead, making new history. Scranton and Schuylkill counties welcome new branches of the NAACP. How organizers hope to make an impact and their voices heard. I'm hoping that when they see me, they see change, but they see good change. And a changing of the guard for another local NAACP. We'll meet the energetic young leader next. You're watching a special Eyewitness News presentation honoring black history. Schuylkill County is looking to make history with the new branch of the NAACP. This idea took steam over the summer months and now the group is awaiting official accreditation. Eyewitness News reporter Ravithi Janaswamy spoke with the founding members of the group about their goals. All of us minorities, we have families, we have children to feed, we want jobs. That's all, just to be inclusive and be fair. By the beginning of March, Schuylkill County will have a new NAACP branch. The last branch was active over four decades ago. You know, we're gonna be proactive, heavy handed with education in a lot of different areas, just making people aware of a lot of different things through the school districts, through unemployment, uh, through police work. Organizers tell me they began discussing the creation of the Schuylkill County NAACP in early 2020. Now, almost a year later, that idea has come to life. I met with organizing committee members at the historic Bethel AME Church in Pottsville. The church, founded in 1842, is where Nicholas Biddle is buried. Biddle is an African American who is believed to be the first person to be wounded in the Civil War. Snowell has attended the church since his childhood. He says he moved away from the county to escape discrimination he faced while growing up. But now he's back with one goal, to create a healthy change in the community. Well, with all the unrest that has happened, mainly because of George Floyd, um, that's what sparked a lot of people to start talking online. Um, and then we start chatting online and the common consensus was that, you know, there was nothing for people to go when they run into trouble or they're discriminated against. Um, we identif identifying uh, different shortcomings of existing uh, organizations in the community, you know, they're doing good work, but there's still disparities that are left behind. And so that's kind of the basis of forming the NAACP for the county is because they do a little bit better job at addressing some of those issues that are left behind. 
Rubina Turin is a member of the Schuylkill County NAACP Organizing Committee. She is also part of the nonprofit Schuylkill Vision that aims to fight racism. The group held community listening sessions and created a survey to discuss the topic. But it was a good uh, start uh, to see how people feel about racism in the county. And the evidence was pretty strong uh, that we really need to further uh, our mission to do something about it. To make the branch official, the committee had to submit an application and sign up a minimum of 100 adult members. Marukis says forming the group was the easy part. Showing up is, you know, sometimes half the battle. And so now I would say the real work begins in starting those, uh, starting that communication and that cross collaboration between groups between ethnic lines, between race lines, uh, between different uh, social strata, even within the county. In Pottsville, Ravthi Janaswamy, Eyewitness News. Tareen says events highlighting Black History Month are planned, including an event that will pay tribute to the first African-American heavyweight champion, Jack Johnson, along with local heroes. They hope to be accredited sometime soon. In Lackawanna County, a new NAACP branch started organizing in 2020, but the members have been very active in the community, making their voices heard and their strong commitment to community service for some time now. Eyewitness News reporter Kevin Hayes has been closely following their journey from the beginning. It's been less than a year since the idea even came about to have a branch of the NAACP here in Lackawanna County, and more specifically here at the intersection of Linden and Washington in the Electric City, we've seen the organization grow. We are so grateful and we're looking forward to continuing to work with everyone. It was in the wake of the death of George Floyd that we saw communities band together. We've been trying to do this for some time and finally we have the right people in place uh, to help facilitate this and, and get it off the ground and get a firm foundation. More than 100 official members joined in less than 100 days. The chants in Courthouse Square grew quieter as the work spread throughout the Electric City and beyond. We're getting our name out there, we're getting our intentions out there, and um, all I can hope for is that, you know, people hold on to that, run with it, and know that they ha we have their best interests in mind. While the committee worked tirelessly to promote information, equality, and community, they also became involved in putting the spotlight on the issues. In mid-November, information was leaked about two Scranton police officers who had been terminated for racist behavior. Roundtables with the mayor, chief of police, and different organizations, including the NAACP, began. We're not here to create um, a vice between us or the community and its officials. We're here to make sure that the community is cohesive and we all coalesce together. We're definitely a part of the conversation and we're definitely going to be a part of the solution. Talks have continued and organizing committee chairman Tyrone Holmes tells us they believe it will not be a systemic issue moving forward. The chief of police has done his due diligence. He's continuing to do that. We don't want the entire department to be scarred because of the actions of two people. The committee has also helped feed those in need, strongly encouraged supporting local minority-owned business. Never tiring, there's even a 90-day action plan in place, including elections and the formation of committees. The focus moving forward is recruiting, networking, and the youth. We have to teach the younger generation. They're, they're going to take our place. So you don't wait until they're 30 or 40 years old. You start talking to them now, nurturing them, bringing them along, and let them have a voice. Any day now, the national and state organizations for the NAACP will give Lackawanna County the green light. They'll join a network that's quickly growing from central Pennsylvania out to the Poconos and beyond in the fight for civil liberties. In Scranton, Kevin Hayes, Eyewitness News. Still to come, a double dose of inspiration. She bakes treats for all to enjoy, but her early life was anything but sweet. It's a story of hope and having a little faith. Just grab yourself by your bootstraps. Be like, okay, I fell down. I'm not dead. Let me get up and keep it moving. And a Scranton man turned his life around from homeless to a businessman and is now a positive role model for youngsters. You're watching a special Eyewitness News presentation honoring black history. 
There's a changing of the guard for one local organization. Eyewitness News reporter Kevin Hayes has been talking with community leaders and has the details on the transition of new leadership for the Wilkes-Barre area NAACP. It's a new era for the Wilkes-Barre chapter of the NAACP. They have a fresh young face coming into the presidency and that's going to complement a lot of the knowledge of the old guard. I'm hoping that when they see me, they see change but they see good change. Uh After years of leadership for the Wilkes-Barre NAACP, Ron Felton has paved the way for a new president. The young people had stepped forward once again. They stepped forward during the civil rights movement when they felt uh, the adults just wasn't being aggressive enough. While Felton has fond memories and triumphs to hang his hat on, he's been looking for someone to step up to the plate for some time. We're, they're replacing a lot of us older people with this young and more energetic group of young people, which I can only say that I welcome. Enter Jamil Castile, a Brooklyn transplant who has been active from Bloomsburg University across NEPA for the better part of a decade. They trust me because I have the experience within the association, so they believe that I can get the job done. He's been groomed in the NAACP's National Next Gen program, and he's an advisor on the state level to the college and youth division. Now he's looking to do what so many activists have tried, to bridge the generational gap. I think the younger voice, we have social media, we have all these different platforms, we can get information on demand. I hope that my presence brings some young adults, brings some new energy. Like I said, it's a marathon, I'm just fresh legs. So, you know, I'm, I'm just going to carry it on. Of course, Callist excited to step into this leadership role, and Ronald Felton more than eager to hand off the torch. In downtown Wilkes-Barre, Kevin Hayes, Eyewitness News. The new president says he's looking forward to continuing a lot of what the branch and Felton have been doing, and that includes being a role model for other newer branches coming to the area. A historic first in Pennsylvania politics, and her name is Joanna McClinton. She's breaking the glass ceiling in the Keystone State as the new Pennsylvania House Minority Leader. She is a fourth-term legislator representing the 191st District, including Southwest Philly, Cobbs Creek, and two boroughs in Delaware County. But it is the first time in the history of the Pennsylvania legislature that a black woman has been elected by her peers to be the floor leader in the House of Representatives. Her journey leading up to the state capitol would include waiting tables while in law school, becoming a public defender, and working for a local legislator as chief counsel. That was all done before running for public office herself, something she never imagined doing. So I'm excited to be the first woman, of course, the first African-American woman. And I am really thrilled because it shows me that women who are coming after me will have even more opportunities to go even higher and to get, be able to kick down all the ceilings until there aren't any more. Representative McClinton is also very involved in her church and is an ordained minister at her church in Philadelphia. When we come back, life has not always been so sweet as pie for Faith Lane, but she managed to stay strong and determined. Even though I had a really rough life, I've always had one best friend, and that's been God. It's a story filled with love, hope, and plenty of faith. You're watching a special Eyewitness News presentation honoring black history. A local man is taking the difficult times he's endured throughout his life and turned them around to become a role model in Scranton. Eyewitness News reporter Kevin Hayes has our story. As my mother gave it to me. It's been around for a long time. The nickname, like the man who carries it, isn't easily explained. Many in South Scranton look up to the owner of Butters Barbershop and Salon on Pittston Ave and these suds and duds on Cary, but it wasn't always that way. I grew up selling things that could get me in trouble, so I changed my product. It, it allowed me to become where I'm at today. Butters, whose real name is Amar Bell, has an extensive rap sheet and just years ago went from incarcerated to watching his mother pass of cancer. From there, sleeping in the back of a barber shop he was cutting hair at, finally buying the entire building and now being a prominent business owner. 
It's a series of life lessons he now passes on to clients and the community. Butter is a good man, and um, you'll learn some stuff from him. Teach the youth that, that if you put your mind to something, you could, you could do anything you want and, and be what you want to be. Furthering change in the electric city, Butters has helped many others progress. I was looking for a job, looking for employment, and he had a spot, took the chance with me. And once those people get to know him, they see why others want to as well. He's a great role model, to be honest. For someone that, you know, I think it's a life story. It's a life example. It's been more than 40 years of ups and a whole lot of downs for Amar Bell, who showed us the old rundown barber shop where he was living when he turned his life around. He says those are just the obstacles everyone can overcome, and he's more than willing to set the example. A lot of people who live my life are either in jail forever or um, dead. You, know? you have to just grab yourself by your bootstraps and be like, okay, I fell down. I'm not dead. Let me get up and keep it moving. In South Scranton, Kevin Hayes, Eyewitness News. Just days after Bell started his businesses, the barber shop was closed because of the pandemic. The good news is that both businesses are now up and running again. Coming up on Honoring Black History 2021, a local connection to baseball history. We'll meet Leon Day and show you why this Hall of Fame pitcher was the talk of the town in Scranton back in the early 1950s. And just a reminder that you can learn much more about Black History Month on pahomepage.com. You're watching a special Eyewitness News presentation honoring Black History. Many of you are familiar with Faith Lane, who appears often in our PA Live kitchen. She's the owner of Faith Lane Pies and tempts us with some wonderful sweet treats. But Faith's story did not begin sweet. She encountered some rocky roads along the way, but her strong faith in God helped her. Eyewitness News reporter Chris Bohinski stopped by her kitchen and explains why we all should have a little faith. I was born uh, to a mother that was a drug addict, and so was my dad. So they both died when I was five years old. And uh, from there, my life was like kind of horrific. If there was a recipe for Faith Lane's young life, it would include a myriad of ingredients that would have many losing faith. From 6 to 12 years old, I was molested by my uncle. And that abuse changed Faith into someone she knew she wasn't. I was labeled a problem child because I would go to school and I would, like, misbehave. I would have fights, like, every day. I, I was just that kid that you didn't want to have in your classroom. Even though she was living with her aunts and uncles, she says they made her feel like a rotten egg. I remember I was so hungry. For 12-year-old Faith, that hunger and abuse reached a boiling point. She knew she needed to get out. So I just went out the door, and um, I just started running. The next nine years of Faith's life included stays in more than 20 foster homes. But there was one constant in her life, her friend's mom, Miss Josephine Porter. I would go over her house all the time. She would cook, like, really good meals. And um, she would love on me, and she'd treat me like I was her daughter. The texture is super important. Their friendship was the recipe Faith needed in her life. She just um, would teach me everything, like how to make like cakes and pies and like different foods. Miss Porter's famous dessert was sweet potato pie, a recipe she had passed on to Faith. You can let it cool, but um, it's easier to make it when it's hot because I put the butter in there, it all like marinates and with the steam. It's easier to mix. It mixes really well when the potato is still hot. While sweet potato pie's history traces back to slavery, Faith says she is no longer a slave to her past. I don't measure because I already know what it, what it looks like. And that's what it should look like. <laughs> <laughs> a little cinnamon, a little nutmeg, like a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of nutmeg. And despite many tribulations in her life, Faith professes that her life is truly blessed. Even though I had a really rough life, I've always had one best friend, and that's been God. Faith's secret ingredient in life? And I always pray. 
So I pray for people that will be receiving my pie um, as they are eating the pie, that God may intervene in their hearts and their minds. And I thank you, Jesus, for us being here to do this, God, for the opportunity that uh, my mom has been given and the pies that she makes. Thank you, God, for her talent. You have to have the faith to believe in Him, to receive Him. And just like you, we have to have a little faith. Amen. Yes. <laughs> In Wilkesbury, I'm Chris Bohinski, Eyewitness News. Faith is very active in her church community. And we have information on where you can order Faith's Pies on pahomepage.com. Adding voices of diversity to local government, we will spend some time with Clark Summit Councilwoman Ronnie Lopez as she blazes a new trail in local politics. And we'll meet the baseball pitching legend who beat the great Satchel Page not once, but three times. Leon Day's connection to NEPA and how the community embraced his talents. You're watching a special Eyewitness News presentation honoring black history. Of all the great baseball players who've played in the Scranton area, many experts would say the greatest of them all never played in the major leagues. His name is Leon Day, a devastating right-handed Hall of Fame pitcher whose story is as celebrated as it is sad, a monumental talent who never got to see the show because of the color of his skin. The year was 1952 and an aging Leon Day took the field for the Scranton Miners, a St. Louis Browns affiliate playing at Scranton Stadium in Dunmore. Day had already logged in 14 seasons, mainly with the Negro Leagues, and he was hoping for a crack at the show some five years after Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier, but it wasn't meant to be. For some, it just came too late. He lost three years serving his country in that regard too. But I think if there was any opportunity for him to play, he was going to be there and to do so. And Day was ready and willing to play just about anywhere. Stints with the Baltimore Black Sox, Brooklyn Eagles, Newark Eagles, and winter ball in Puerto Rico led him to northeastern Pennsylvania. And the stats don't lie. Day was considered by some to be a better pitcher than the great Satchel Page. In fact, in head-to-head -head competition, Day won three out of four games. Day was a good hitter too. In 1937, he hit over 300 with a perfect 13-0 pitching record. He also played every position except catcher, and he did all of it while battling systemic racism. Remember, they couldn't stay in the hotel. They had their own buses. They had their own dry cleaners, their own banks. When you think about that sort of atmosphere and the results that were produced, it's just phenomenal. But Scranton embraced Leon Day's talent. Newspaper accounts show his arrival in the Electric City was a big deal. From the articles that I found, this gentleman was very celebrated among sports fans and among the community in general. They're getting heavy coverage in the papers, like not only the days after the games, but also the days before the games leading up to it. And Leon Day is a big part of that too. It was almost like he was a feature uh, for people to come out to see. Local baseball historian Nicholas Petula believes they relished the job in Scranton despite the Browns' reputation as a bad franchise. The Saint Louis Browns. To people who followed the game, Day was one of the greats. Even if I'm hooking up with a team like the St. Louis Browns, who were considered a joke even at that time in the major leagues, you know, Maybe something can happen for me. Maybe I can, you know, catch some lightning. But I think the real baseball people at that time, I think they recognized that this was a, a superstar that had been denied. A ruling in December by Major League Baseball reclassifies Negro Leagues to be considered the Major Leagues, meaning Day is now a Major Leaguer. MLB will now evaluate Negro League stats and determine which will be included in MLB's historical numbers. Day died in 1995, again just days after finding out he was elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York. If you want to find out more about Leon Day, Go to PAHomepage.com. There you will find a link to the Leon Day Foundation, which helps get inner city youth involved with baseball. 
Still ahead, he was a professional boxer, activist, and personality the media just couldn't resist. We're talking, of course, about the man nicknamed the greatest, Muhammad Ali, a trip to his training camp as we continue to honor Black History Month. You're watching a special Eyewitness News presentation honoring Black History. Black history has had strong roots in the Clark Summit area of Lackawanna County since the Civil War era. Waverly and Clark's Green Townships served as stops along the Underground Railroad. Now the borough of Clark Summit continues to break the racial divide. Eyewitness News reporter Julie Dunphy has the story. This corner of Lackawanna County is steeped with African American history. Nearby, Clark's Green and Waverly were just a couple of communities that helped former slaves escape to freedom in the Underground Railroad. Fast forward nearly 200 years, Clark Summit's local leaders have broken the racial divide once again. On August 31st, 2020, Ronnie Lopez was sworn in as a Clark Summit Councilwoman. That moment's bigger than me. That moment represents for other women of color to potentially have that same position. And that's what I wanted that moment to be about. Now, six months into her new position, Lopez says she's getting the knack of it, finding her voice and making a difference in people's lives. I think our best accomplishment thus far is that we haven't had to increase taxes for the borough, which is always a plus. It's been a difficult year for people during the pandemic, and I think anywhere where they can save, we try to make that possibility for them. Lopez is the first African-American councilwoman in Lackawanna County. She's also part Hispanic. And I think it's important for people to be able to look to the representatives and see themselves, whether that be in their ethnicity, their gender, especially in the climate that we're living in today. I think that's critical. And the fact that I get to be a positive representation for people of color is a huge bonus for me. Lopez follows Mayor Herman Johnson in marking a historic role in the county. Johnson was appointed mayor of Clark Summit in October 2016, making him the first African American mayor in Lackawanna County's history. He's actually become a mentor to me. He's someone that I admire. What he's been able to do for this borough I think is incredible. The barriers that he's broken down and he works collaboratively with everyone. And it doesn't stop there. Lopez's younger brother, Ron Thomas, sits on council as a junior member. On our last meeting, he brought up his concerns about police activity after the insurrection occurred at the Capitol. It's nice to see that he's actually initiating ideas and voicing his concerns and kind of finding his own place as well. All three trailblazers individually and side by side, hoping they inspire others to follow in their footsteps. I think it's not just about remembering where we came from, but also know where we're going in the future. And I think this past year more than ever, I'm incredibly proud of what my generation, the millennial generation has done for black community. And I know one day that that will be noted as being historical for Black History Month. Reporting in Clark Summit, Julie Dunphy, Eyewitness News. Ronnie Lopez says her wish is to one day have her brother sit on council with her as a councilman. And just a reminder that you can learn much more about Black History Month on PAHomepage.com. You're watching a special Eyewitness News presentation honoring Black History. Recently, we featured the story of a local Marine Corps veteran who returned from overseas service, but was met by a new set of challenges. Eyewitness News reporter Kevin Hayes brings us his story of optimism in the face of adversity. A shining product of the foster system, alumni of GAR High School, and a young man on a mission. Meet Elijah John Scratching. I wanted to prove something, prove that I could do something better. He would challenge himself to step on the yellow footprints in Paris Island, South Carolina, to become one of the few, the proud. I was tired of people telling me I was gonna end up in jail or not be able to do anything just because of the circumstances I was brought up in. Seemingly a lifetime ago, the year was 2019. Corporal Scratching returns to Wilkesbury from active duty as an ammunition technician, not knowing exactly what the world had in store for him. Coming back from Okinawa, Japan, coming back to the United States, I was gone for a while. I was over there for a couple years, so coming back here, I have to readjust to how American life is. That life would take several unexpected turns, starting with a global pandemic. Now, a world away from his wife, young child, and family forged in the core. Hey, Ma. Chan -chan. I'm hoping to get over there soon, at least see my daughter, you know, before her first birthday. <laughs> Just months after starting to adjust, gaining employment, and settling into the new normal, another call to action. Did I just see that, you know? 
That man just died. He's begging for his life, calling out for his mom, and he just dies. So I'm like, oh no, this has got to, you know what I mean? Like, this has got to change. As a young black man, he knew he needed to be part of the solution. He shared with me his own experiences of being profiled and stopped by police even after his service. None of those cases leading to further incident, and his faith in good policing remains. But Scratching says he's one of the lucky ones, and it further fuels his desire to step up against injustice. I know some great officers who really do a good job, like a really good job out here, especially Wilkes-Barre. Like what we learn in the military, we see somebody doing something wrong, correct them about it. Don't matter if they're your uncle, brother, cousin, mother. Officers who see other officers doing something wrong, correct them about it, you know what I mean? Because then at that time, if you let them do something bad, you're the bad guy too. Millions across the nation agreeing and scores of people regularly making their way to places like Public Square in solidarity with scratching and a growing message. It felt great because that means like you're not the only person thinking about it, you know? Like if one or two or more people are thinking the same thing you are, you know what I mean? Probably more do too. So getting that response from people was great. Despite the challenges of 2020, he remains optimistic. It seems like a lot of good things are happening in spite of like all the bad stuff going on. It gives me hope, you know? Nothing has been able to grind him down. He remains a proud family man. Also, recently promoted at work and will be pursuing a degree in psychology from Wilkes University. Battling the odds, Scratching leaves us with earned wisdom. Take every bit of good from this year, take that with you and continue on with that through the rest of the years of your life. The bad stuff, tuck it away, but remember, have faith in yourself, have faith in the people around you, and just go forward and keep, keep striving to be better. In Wilkesbury, Kevin Hayes, Eyewitness News. Up next, he swung like a butterfly, stung like a bee, and set up a training camp in Schuylkill County, Pennsylvania that today allows a new generation to experience the greatest, Muhammad Ali. And we remind you that you can learn much more about Black History Month on PAHomepage.com. You're watching a special Eyewitness News presentation honoring Black History. Muhammad Ali will long be remembered as the greatest, a sweet-talking boxer with one heck of a knockout punch. He was also an entertainer and an activist, and you can learn about one of the most celebrated athletes at his training camp located in Deer Lake, Schuylkill County. Eyewitness News Sports Director A.J. Donatoni takes us there. On the last week, I murdered a rock, injured a stone, hospitalized a brick. I'm so mean, I make medicine sick. Muhammad Ali, born Cassius Clay, a global icon, not just for his success in the boxing ring, but for his lasting impact with regard to social justice. And his extraordinary life has roots right here in Schuylkill County. This was the hub. He trained here for George Foreman. He trained here for every big fight that he's ever had. Here in Deer Lake, a town of just a few hundred people, there's a narrow road that leads to this place, which was Ali's training center for the second half of his boxing career. So how did Ali come to call this secluded sanctuary his training home? It was thanks to one person from NEPA. Muhammad Ali's business manager was Gene Kilroy, a Mahanoy City native. It was Kilroy that convinced Ali to come here to Deer Lake to train. And there's an entire section of this gymnasium dedicated to him called Kilroy's Corner. It's expensive to do training away from the actual uh, fields or the actual boxing rings. But uh, uh, Kilroy told Muhammad Ali, he said, I'm going to make a businessman out of you. And that's how he basically convinced him to come here. So starting in 1974 and up until his retirement, Ali would travel to Schuylkill County before his fights. There's the gymnasium, of course, but the complex included lodging on top of the hill, a kitchen, a basketball court, and a mosque where Ali would often pray. He ran here, he trained here, he did all of his road work here, but it was self-contained, so it, it is a, a little mini uh, community unto itself. Following Ali's retirement, the facility was sold and used for other purposes. But in 2016, shortly after Ali's death and with the property up for sale again, the son of a football legend stepped in. Mike Madden, son of the famous football coach slash Monday night announcer John Madden, was such a 
big fan of Muhammad Ali. I called the number right then and there, having no idea what in the heck I was getting myself into. And um, about six weeks later, I owned it. <laughs> Mike Madden made it his mission to restore the training camp to honor the great champion. Today, it exists as Fighters Heaven. Let's create something, uh, you know, where kids can learn and, and future generations can learn and appreciate uh, who he was, what he did while he was in Schuylkill County. But everybody that we bring, uh, that we bring kind of on campus, um, you know, from kids to old people, uh, the place does resonate and there is there is a vibe there and it's real and it's undeniable. It's undeniable that Ali and Fighters Heaven will have an impact on generations for years to come. You know, probably the most rec recognizable man, you know, that's walked the planet in my lifetime. You know, he's still uh, a viable, legitimate idol to, to kids today. You can feel his legacy when you're in here. He would tell someone, you know, life is short. Make something of your life. And that's, that's what we're going to try to, to transcend here to all the visitors. In Deer Lake, A.J. Donatoni, Eyewitness News. Thank you for joining us for this special presentation honoring Black History Month. We certainly hope you enjoyed many stories of the achievements and accomplishments of those in the black community in northeastern and central Pennsylvania. And we have more stories to inspire you on PAHomepage.com. For everyone here at Eyewitness News, I'm Candace Kelly. And I'm Nick Toma. Thank you for watching.